Welcome to worship at Sussex Christian Reformed Church on this lovely Sunday morning. I'm glad you all got the memo about the time change. We're grateful for uh, the chance to be here. I know we lose an hour, so uh, maybe you feel a little extra groggy, but it's good to be together. Good to be in this space to worship the name of Jesus our Lord. And it's good to see the sunshine and be reminded of God's grace, which is new every morning. So we just want to extend a welcome to uh, everyone who's here worshiping with us this morning. We're grateful for the chance to see you. We're grateful for the opportunity to be together. And if you're new with us this morning, I want to just uh, extend a special welcome to you and remind you and everybody else here of who we are and what we're all about. First of all, my name is Kendall. I get to be the pastor of this church. And our goal as a congregation, uh, we believe the mission of our church is to grow disciples of Jesus Christ. And to do that, we're going to focus on four key things. We're going to focus on the Word of God, the worship of God, the community of God, and the mission of God. So that's why we open up the Bible to hear what God has to say to us through His Word. That's why we sing songs of worship to prepare us for a whole life of worship. That's why we pray for each other and spend some time in fellowship as a community. That's why we look for ways to engage our community and our world on mission, all because of what God has done for us. So a couple quick announcements this morning. First of all, every Sunday we have uh, two offerings. The first offering is for the general fund. That's the broad ministries of our church. Our secondary offering this morning is going to be for benevolence. And a reminder, our deacons will be collecting those, passing the plates later on in the worship service service. And if you are new with us, that's there's no obligation for you at all, but uh, that's a specific act of worship for those who belong uh, to the family of God. Uh, also, we had a great first new members class yesterday. We had uh, 15 participants, which is awesome. I know there's uh, at least five other people that couldn't make it yesterday that I'll be following up with. But uh, if you're interested in becoming a new member and weren't able to be there at the class yesterday, uh, please talk to me. I know I have to follow up with a few people to do a makeup class. But our second session, our second class, will be two weeks from from yesterday, so that's March 23, uh, Saturday morning from 9 to 11. And uh, I brought bagels and a little fruit, coffee, and orange juice, so uh, it's a good time, good to be together, and good to learn about what it means to belong to this congregation. Also, this Wednesday night, we have a special prayer service. Our denomination, the Christian Reformed Church, dedicates one night uh, per year to spend specifically in prayer for our communities, our churches, and our nation and our world. So we'll be gathering on Wednesday night here in this space at 7 p.m. So we'll have some specific prayer readers. I'm looking for a couple other people to, uh, to, uh, to offer some prayer. So if you're interested in that, I'd love to uh, talk to you. But we look forward to spending that time. So if you're available, that'd be a great time for worship and pray for our church and community. And with that, I'm going to invite us, uh, I want to actually invite you to stand as we hear God inviting us with a time of a call to worship. Hear this invitation from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. God himself is inviting us to come into this place of worship, reminding us that he is the one who gives us those clean hands. So let's sing our praise to him. All hail the power of Jesus' name, and he is exalted.
triune God has invited us to worship him with pure hearts. We've begun to sing his praises, and he reminds us by the power of the Spirit, he is here already with us. So receive this greeting from our God. People of God, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ, and from the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. We begin our time of worship with praise, exalting the name of Jesus. We also turn and uh, spend some time in confession, recognizing that even as we pray to a good and holy God, we recognize that we are not worthy. So I invite you to bow your heads with me, bow your hearts, as we turn to our God in a prayer of confession. I'm going to take this from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. Please pray with me. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge." Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. We acknowledge our sins before God, but we also receive this word of assurance from Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. People of God, rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Let's sing a song of response, not what my hands have done. Let's sing verses 1 through 3.
beautiful words of assurance, turning us to Jesus, reminding us that we can be forgiven through his blood. Before we go to our congregational prayer, I missed one announcement. So uh, those who participate in senior Bible study, there's a correction in our bulletin. So we won't be looking at lesson eight this week uh, in senior Bible study. We'll be looking at lesson seven. So just so you're prepared, lesson seven, we'll be uh, excited to go through that conversation on Tuesday. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we turn to our God in our morning prayer. Sovereign Lord, we thank you for waking us up this morning. Truly, you are the God who is creator of the heavens and the earth, and the God who provides for your people, and the God who holds all things together according to your grace and according to your plan. Nothing is outside of your control. Surely not a hair can fall from our heads without your will. Lord, we thank you that you are in control. We thank you that you are the creator and sustainer of all creation. And we thank you that you, this God of all creation, invite us, sinful, broken, lowly human beings, into fellowship with yourself so that we can serve you, partnering with you to restore all things. We thank you for the work that you have done to invite us to walk with you. What a privilege it is to be able to call ourselves children of God because of what you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. What a privilege it is to know that we can belong to you and belong to the local church to serve you in this community. So Lord, we praise you for all that you've done. We praise you for the beauty of creation. We praise you for the breath in our lungs. We praise you for the gathering of your people to worship your name. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as your people. Lord, we thank you for technology that even helps us connect with those who can't be physically in this place. And so we pr pray specifically for those who are worshiping from home or on the go. We're thankful for them, and we pray that you would speak your words of comfort and peace to them, and that your Holy Spirit would sustain them and uphold them. Lord, we thank you for each of the worshipers who's here this morning. No matter what's on our hearts, no matter what's on our minds, we thank you that you welcome us to bring all of those things into your presence. There is nothing we have to check out at the door before we come to you, but you welcome us to bring those things to you, whether there's sorrow on our heart, whether there is frustration in our minds, whether we are bitter, whether we are scared, whether we are full of joy and have hearts overflowing, we thank you that we can turn those experiences into worship because you understand what it means to walk in our shoes. So Lord, we praise you that you welcome us, we praise you that you walk with us, and that you change us according to your plan for us. So we lift up before you some particular needs of this body of believers and our world as a whole. Lord, we pray for Lisa Thiessen's mom as she was in the hospital this week. Lord, we praise you that she has returned home, but uh, we know that that's going to be a little bit of a road as she will go through some follow-up. So we pray for wisdom for the doctors and for those who need to make decisions for her, and we pray for peace uh, throughout, both for her and for Eric and Lisa and for all those that surround her. Lord, we thank you that uh, Kim Seitzma's mom uh, has uh, been able to get this surgery to remove this cancerous spot in her mouth. We thank you that it seems to have gone very well, and we pray for your continued healing for her and for her strength as she recovers too. Lord, we pray for our local community. We pray for all of those who struggle to find adequate housing. We pray for businesses that seem to be holding on, uh, just going week to week barely able to provide and survive. Lord, we pray for your flourishing in this community. We pray for people that need your provision. We pray for your help to be offered to them. And we pray that the local church would be an active part in helping people rebuild their lives and, and be able to provide those uh, important needs. We pray for our witness in our community. We pray that those would look to the church and see that there is something about us that they long for. We pray that they too would look to the God that we serve because they see the evidence of your love and grace through the church. So grant us everything we need to serve you well. 
And Lord, we pray for our nation and our world too. We know there is much brokenness. We know that there is much heartache. And Lord, we pray for your peace to reign. We pray for godly leaders to rise up and to have wise decisions and to do so on, um, with the good of the people in mind. And Lord, we pray for peace, especially in places of war where many innocent people are caught in the crossfire. Lord, we pray for restoration and for your provision in those places. Lord, we pray all these things knowing that you truly are sovereign, that you are in control, and you are the God who hears our prayers and can do something about our world. So, Lord, we thank you that we're able to worship you. We're thankful for the opportunity uh, to gather together and to hear your word proclaimed. So speak to us, walk with us, comfort us by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We prepare to open up God's word with us uh, this morning. I invite you to stand as we sing together, Breathe on me, breath of God. Let's sing those four verses. Invite our little praisers to come on down as you're invited to learn more about Jesus downstairs. We're going to invite one of our elders to come and pray for you and pray for us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord. We thank you for this sunshine. We thank you, thank you that we could all gather together, Lord, to hear your word, Lord. We thank you for the little praisers and all these little kids in our church, Lord, that are the future of our church, Lord, in the next 20 to 30 years, Lord. Continue to bless them, Lord. Give them a good life, too, Lord. Let them learn more about your word on their level each and every day, Lord. Quiet our minds, quiet our hearts, Lord. Give pastor a clear voice and an open mind, too, Lord, to, to preach your word, too, Lord, that we can go about in this community, Lord, and spread the light, Lord, and uh, let us all be shining lights in our community each and every day. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 
morning I invite you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. We're going to read right at the end of uh, 2 Chronicles. We're going to read verses 14 through the end, verse 23. And uh, as we do, just a reminder of what we've been doing in this season of Lent as we anticipate celebrating and remembering uh, Jesus' work on the cross and in the empty tomb on Good Friday and Easter. We've been looking at the covenants of God, how he has made promises to his people, and uh, ultimately those promises is is that he will be their God and he invites them to be his people. And so he makes promises to his people and he invites a response from them too to walk with him in faithful obedience. And so we've seen a number of different uh, covenants that God has made with his people, both promises he makes and promises he uh, invites them to make back to him. This morning we're going to see some of the results of those promises. So we're going to look at the end of 2 Chronicles and see how this all comes together in a particular time uh, as Judah, uh, the people of God, are coming to the end of uh, their time of the king. So let's continue reading uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 14. Furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful, following all the detestable practices of the nations and defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of God was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. He brought up against them the king of ba- the Babylonians, who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary, and did not spare young men or young women, the elderly or the infirm. God gave them all into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. He carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple, and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his successors until the king of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to also put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up, and may the Lord their God be with them. A promise is really important. And I've discovered that there's a particular way to make a promise that is especially binding. And it involves a finger. A pinky promise. You see, this is something my children have taught me. You see, it's not just enough for a parent to make a promise to children. They want an extra level of assurance that, uh, you know, mom or dad is going to fulfill what they've promised, that said that they were going to, that's going to do what they uh, said that they were going to do. I think we're pretty trustworthy, but that added layer gives them that extra sense of assurance because I think they want a guarantee. It's as if, okay, Dad, I know you're promising me, but I'm going to ask for that pinky promise. And you extend that pinky and you shake that. That's a binding agreement. Now, you break that pinky promise and, well, now you have to make up for a lot of lost trust, right? Well, now that promise doesn't have any more weight anymore. Well, now there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that need to be made up after that. The, pro- the promise would prove to be meaningless, no matter how sincerely I believed I would fulfill it when I made that promise. I guess that's why it said, don't make promises you can't keep. Now this week in God's word, we see the effect of broken promises. Now not that God broke his promises to his people, but that the people broke their promises to him. So over the past few weeks, we've talked about how God made covenants with his people, And as we saw, covenants are formal agreements with promises. 
So God has given the people of God the assurance that he would be faithful to him or to them. Now, in those covenants, God has been inviting them to faithfully walk with him in obedience. He's given them every reason why they should be faithful to him. He has blessed them immensely as a people and a nation. Everything they have has come from him. Their land was given as a gift for them to live on. He's blessed them with material resources. He blessed them with a temple, and that was the place where the presence of God was supposed to live with his people. And that was a place where they would come and worship the name of the Lord who was with them, who lived with them and dwelt with them. He's given them protection from their enemies. Really, he's given them everything they needed in order to be faithful. God answered his promises to Abraham. He made them into a great nation. He gave them the promised land. And he blessed them. Well, the generations come and go. And sometimes the people of God walk with him in obedience. And sometimes they disobey because they want to be like all the other nations around them. Well, the story goes on. The times of obedience grow more and more rare. And the times of disobedience become way too common. And so, as we see, it's going to result in exile. It's going to result in a punishment. So that's really what the story of Chronicles is all about. It's actually written to the people of God after they've returned back to the land after the exile. But they have all these questions. Even as they return, they wonder, does God really still care about us? Do we even have a future with God anymore? What's going to happen to us? And what is God's plan for us moving forward? Those are the questions on the people's hearts after they've returned from the punishment that God offers to them. So that's where the author of Chronicles reminds them of their history, reminds them of why they had to go into exile in the first place, and reminds them everything that God was doing along the way. So before he gets to God's faithfulness, We see a lot of unfaithfulness, particularly from the kings of Judah. So before we get to uh, the passage that we just read this morning, it goes through, now the book of Chronicles actually is the same time frame as the book of, the books of Kings. Really they're you know, First and Second Chronicles is one book. Uh, First and Second Kings was originally one book. We're talking about the same time period from a different perspective. And so just before we come to the end of Chronicles, it's listed all these different kings and what their response to God has been like. And so the last three kings that is mentioned in the end of Chronicles are all described with this little phrase. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's become the norm. And as leaders go, so go the church, or so go the people of God. And so every time they have one of these ungodly kings, the people of God grow farther and farther away from God. Now, sometimes they've had in their history godly kings, people that uh, looked at the law of God, led with hearts that truly wanted to serve the Lord their God, who made sure the people of God worshipped and lived in a way that was honoring and pleasing to their God. And in those seasons, God blessed the people. But then you have so many of these examples of the kings who did evil in the eyes of the Lord, who rejected all God's instructions, and who simply wanted to do whatever served them the best. And so what is the result of this ongoing unfaithfulness? Well, now we see that this is becoming the norm and God needs to do something about it. So this morning we're going to look at three different covenant results. As God has made promises to his people and invited them to make promises back to himself, we're going to see the results at the end of Chronicles, at the end of this season of the nation of Judah. So this morning, it seems to be the case where that's become the norm. The people of God are far away. Verse 14, it says, All the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful, following all the detestable practices of the nations and defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. So after all the promises of God, all the generations of faithfulness to his people, what's the result? How do the people respond to him? Relentless unfaithfulness. That's covenant result number one. God's people fail to be faithful. They broke their promise to God. And so what was their unfaithfulness like? Verse 15. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again. 
because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of God was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. Now, sometimes we might think of the God of the Old Testament as being different than the God of the New Testament, right? I think sometimes people look at the God of Old Testament as this angry God, right? This vengeful God. They see an unpleasant picture of God because they hear stories of judgment and they hear stories of God doing things that maybe they don't want to see or hear. But I think this is one of those passages where we see God offering judgment to his people But even in the midst of judgment, let's pay attention to the character of God. I think in this passage we see, yes, a judgment, but also incredible patience of God. So with generations of people who have been unfaithful to him, God continues to walk with them, maintaining their place in the world and their temple as their place of worship. And in his, in his attempts to bring them back to him, he sends messengers again and again Prophets who speak God's words to the people. Why? Because he had pity on his people. And he had pity on his dwelling place with, him, with them, the temple. He longed to still have a place with the people and longed for them to be in communion with himself. That's God's goal, is to maintain that relationship with the people that he has made promises to. His goal is not a petty vengeance, as if God is saying, if they're, just gonna, if they're not going to listen to me when I literally gave them everything, I'm just going to make them pay. No, that's not what God is saying. Instead, it's like he says, I love them so much, I'm going to do everything to bring them back to me. So that's his relentless pursuit of them. So it's in spite of God's pursuit of them that they continue to mock the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at the prophets until the wrath of God is aroused and there was no remedy. It's as if God is saying, I've tried everything else and I'm left with no other option. Punishment needs to be doled out. You see, the thing about Israel and Judah's unfaithfulness is that they were supposed to know better. They had it all. They had this relationship with the God of all creation. They were descendants of the promise, children of the covenant. They were the blessed people of God himself, and still they turned away from it all. You ever have it where you think to to yourself, wow, they, that person, had it all, and they still threw it all away. We might say that about like a a famous celebrity, right? They might have everything, the wealth, the riches, the fame, all the things that we might uh, imagine people really want, and still their life crumbles. They still have nothing. Um, Shaquille O'Neal is one example. I've heard a few interviews where he's particularly said, so famous basketball player, right? Incredible career in the NBA. He's publicly made statements, I lost my family. I lost everything because in my pursuit, of everything that I really wanted, you know, the fame and the riches and everything, he never paid attention to what really mattered, his family. He never prioritized those relationships. So even though he had this incredible career, even though he became incredibly wealthy and famous, he still recognizes that I have nothing because I gave it all away. I wasted this incredible thing that I had, and ultimately it left me lacking. It left me wanting something more. You see, all those ties were broken. Now, sometimes having it all isn't enough to make the right decisions. And I think the same is true of believers today. We're supposed to be the ones who are loved by God, who know his promises of salvation. And the thing is, knowing that and knowing all of God's instructions still isn't enough to make us perfectly obedient. We're the ones who have it all, right? We have this relationship with God himself. And yet, still, it's not enough to make us perfectly obedient to God. In fact, even with our best attempts at doing good and honoring God, we're still far far from God's standard for us. Because we still have tendencies to do our own thing, go our own way. We still get jealous of the world's riches, experiences, values, etc. We still go chasing after things that promise to satisfy us. And ultimately, they let us down, leaving us feeling empty. 
And what's worse, they lead us away from God himself. It continues to draw us away from that relationship that we should have with him. And so we might hear God's word, we might read it, we might hear it taught, and we might have that kind of resistance just like the people of Judah did in our text. We might find ourselves hearing God's instructions and saying, oof, yeah, that's not really for me. I want to do my own thing. Or, you know what, I don't really like that person that's uh, teaching this particular thing, and I'm just going to ignore it, right? We can tend to be the people who ignore God's instructions, mocking his prophets and resisting his instruction for our lives. We might not like it because it takes something away from our hope of what we want to achieve in this life. And the reality is, apart from God's intervention, none of us can truly be righteous. Not a single one of us. And even our best attempts at goodness fall so short and still only look like selfishness. So what is God supposed to do with people who relentlessly turn away from him and go our own way? God's justice demands a judgment. So that's covenant result number two. God's judgment on unfaithfulness. So what does God do? He has already tried many times, right? Sending them messenger after messenger, prophet after prophet, hoping to bring them back, and now he's left with no other option. He says there is no remedy. So what does God do? Verse 17. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary, did not spare the young men or young women or the elderly or the sick, God gave them all into the hands of their king, Nebuchadnezzar. And he carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God. He took away all those sacred items that were helping the people worship the name of God himself. He took away all the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. And then, verse 20, he carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. So what is the judgment of God in this text? I think there's four key things. Well, actually, I'll add a fifth. First of all, he brings war on the people of Judah, right? The young men and young women, they fall by the sword. And then what happens? The king, Nebuchadnezzar, comes in and he starts taking things away and destroying things. First, the articles of the temple are taken away to Babylon. That's the elements of their worship. That's an important part of who they are. God's temple and palaces are burned down. This is really important, because what is the temple? That's the very presence of God with the people of God. God giving up the temple among them is saying, I'm removing my presence from among you. And I think that's the scariest of the four judgments here. The the fact that they are losing the very temple, the very presence of God with them. And then they lose their land itself. Jerusalem's walls are torn down. The very thing that protected that holy city. No more. And finally, the remaining people, the remnant, are exiled to Babylon. They're carried away. So God judged the people. Was he wrong to judge the people? Really, he's just taking back all of the blessings that he's given to them that they had essentially taken for granted and abused. The temple as a place of worship. God's daily reminder of his presence with them their protection and their identity as a nation, and their life in the land God gave them. God is the giver of all of these good gifts to them. And ultimately, he has the right to take them back if the people are mistreating those gifts. We might think it's harsh, but on the other hand, God has every right to do that, especially if he sees he has no other option. He has no remedy. So something to be mindful, however, is that God's plan of judgment is not just a punishment for punishment's sake. It's actually a punishment with an end goal, a goal of correction. God is showing himself as a good father, correcting their wrongdoings. So we can think to ourselves, how are we deserving of God's punishment? What are the examples in our lives of our unfaithfulness to him? The places we know ah, don't quite measure up to God's standards. Where we know we're not following God's instructions. 
And I think this is a key part of discipleship. This is a key element of how we walk with God. That's really what discipleship is all about, how we follow after God. So it's an There's a special time during every worship service where we spend some time in confession, right? And why do we make that a regular part of our worship? It's an inventory uh, test. It's a way for us to acknowledge the places in our lives where we fall short. It's a, a way that we can name the places in our lives where we recognize we've been unfaithful to God, and then we turn them over to him, confessing them and trusting in his forgiveness. One of my seminary professors, he had this image. He said, uh, we need to confess our sins just like we need to take out the garbage in the house, right? If we don't take out the garbage, what happens to the house? It all just starts piling up, and you know you can't shove any more down into the can, and then the house starts to stink. And How many husbands got a little elbow in the side right now? But, uh, right, that's why we need to to identify, okay, what's garbage, what's recycling, what's compost, and then we need to remove it. We need to take it out. We need to do something with it. And I think the same is true about the sinful places of our lives. When we can recognize and name, this is some way that I've been unfaithful to God. Now, we take that into the presence of God. We name it before him. We confess it. And... What do we do? We, we recognize that it's through Jesus' blood, through his sacrifice on the cross, that now we can be forgiven. And what does God do? He takes that away. He takes it, removes it from our lives. As far as the east is from the west, he no longer sees the sins in our own hearts because he sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus. So why do we confess our sins? It's a way that we can acknowledge and name the places of unfaithfulness. I think that's a helpful way that we can turn and uh, look to renewed obedience in God because we can remember and recognize the places that we've been unfaithful to him. But we do that also with this recognition that it's ultimately the work of Jesus that saves us. We don't just take out the garbage or take out our sins uh, so that we can, you know, continue to maintain our clean house and, oh shoot, I've sinned, I must confess right away or otherwise, you know, what happens? Well, it's just gonna, you know, I can be fearful. What happens if I die in the next moment, right? Well, no, we still appeal and trust in the faithfulness of Jesus. As long as we have that faith in him, we know that those sins are covered. We acknowledge those before him as a part of our worship and as a part of our discipleship so we continue to look more and more like Jesus. But ultimately, that's what sin does. It separates us from God. And we ought to receive the just punishment, which ultimately is death, both in a physical sense and a spiritual and eternal sense. So even in this picture of punishment, we've already heard this echo of something coming, right? Even uh, that last verse that I read, uh, he carried them away into exile until the kingdom of Persia came to power. You see... Babylon was this great superpower of the day, right? They conquered peoples, they uh, conquered Judah, carried away exiles, while another superpower comes along. And this is part of God's plan for redemption. So covenant number three, covenant result number three, is God's plan for redemption. After 70 years in exile, God, in fulfillment of his promises through Jeremiah the prophet, raises up Cyrus, the king of Persia, to send back the exiles to the land. Verse 23, this is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up, and may the Lord their God be with them. Seventy years, Judah was in exile in Babylon. That's a long time. A long time to be far from everything that you knew to be home. It's a long time to be among a people that's hostile to you and your God. It's a long time to be far from the place where God has given promises to you. But their time in judgment was limited. God never intended it to be forever. He promised to return them home again to the land that he gave them, restoring them as his holy people, restoring his temple with them. That was God's plan of redemption after the punishment. And God used even the king of Persia, who conquered Babylon, to bring his people back to the promised land. God redeemed them. He proved to be faithful yet again. And even in the exile, he brought them back. But his redemption story still seemed to lack something. Because even when they returned from exile, the glory of God didn't quite look the same. They didn't really feel like they had been restored yet. 
Something else was missing. And that's the point. After they return from exile, they're left with this lingering sense that God is not finished with his plan of redemption just yet. That the glory and presence of God hasn't fully arrived yet. Because they were meant to hunger for a day when a new king would take the throne. Not a king like the ones they've already had. Some being faithful to God, some completely unfaithful. No, they're looking forward to a new kind of king. A king who is going to fully embody the very presence and will of God the Father. The kind of king who is truly going to lead his people by God's word. The kind of king who has the power to actually transform the hearts of the people so that they respond to the good and holy God that made promises to them. A king who would rule in perfect justice. One who would defeat their greatest enemies, not the other nations, the enemies of sin and death. The king they wait for is none other than Jesus, the Son of God. It's the unfaithfulness that we have to come to grips with that makes us look to Jesus, hungering for his leadership over this world and over our lives. So here's a question. What are you going through today that makes you wonder some of those same questions that the people of Judah wondered? Like where God is and what your future is supposed to look like with him. Maybe you're, you're in a season with lots of responsibilities and a lot of worries on your heart and you wonder what the future looks like. Maybe you're in a season of life where you feel stuck, like everyone else's lives are moving forward, but yours just seems to be on hold. You're waiting for something to change in your life, and you're left wondering, God, are you still there? What's your plan for me? Maybe you're in a spiritually dark or stale season of life, or a time where you face temptation more strongly uh, than ever before, and you look up and wonder, God, where are you? Are you even there? Maybe your life has taken some turns that you're not proud of, and you wonder why God would even care about you anymore. Maybe you think you're too far gone. Well, hear the good news this morning. God has given us a plan of redemption in his son, Jesus. Even the worst of our rebellion against God isn't enough to keep him from caring about his children. Even the darkest of times are not enough to keep the light of Christ from shining in. Even when we feel stuck, God has not ignored us. Even when we have broken our promises to God, he never breaks his promises to us. So today we're reminded of his unfaithfulness and his promises to us. So today we look to the son Jesus Christ as our hope for redemption. And we look to him to be king over every aspect of our lives. He was and still is the greatest of the promises of God. He lived, he died, he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and he's coming again to rule as the perfect king who turns our hearts back to God the Father. Thanks be to God for his unbroken promises. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for this picture in your word. Even in times of judgment and punishment, we see your grace shining abundantly through. Lord, we thank you that even in our times where we turn away from you, we thank you that you never turn away from us. And so, Lord, we look to Jesus Christ now, the one who ultimately satisfied the perfect judgment of God, who ultimately took our sins upon himself and was sacrificed on the cross in our place. And we thank you that in his name, through faith in what he's accomplished for us, you look at us and you see holy children, righteous children, children that you will never walk away from. So Lord, we pray that you would speak words of comfort to our hearts, that you would help us to see Christ reigning over all areas of our lives. And we pray that that would shine a light to those who need to see it too. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to sing a song that uh, helps us to remember the future promise of God by the Sea of Crystal. Let's stand as we sing those three verses.
take a seat, and Miles Caparis is going to offer just a brief ministry moment about uh, something that's coming. I'm becoming a frequent flyer up here, so... Uh, um, today, uh, we had a very good council meeting um, a while back, and we covered a lot of ground. And we've had a great opportunity um, to look at a church. Uh, pastor every day, or every Sunday, that is. Our mission is to grow disciples, transform the lives for Christ. And that's something, as uh, a council, we take very seriously, along with, um, as elders, our responsibility is to make sure we're developing our spiritual growth throughout the congregation. And we have an opportunity here, and we looked at it in that light of how can we look at the overall leadership of the church. Uh, Carissa had stepped down as worship coordinator. Uh, we're looking at the other, other ministries um, that we developed with the uh, division teams, which discipleship, which is basically folks that are from college age to seniors of having a ministry area. Kim. Um, Seitzma was instrumental in helping kick that off and, and being a director. Uh, and then we also had the Next Gen Ministries where uh, Jennifer Vandergroof did a phenomenal job on uh, developing that program and it made it from something to uh, something fantastic that we're really proud of. But those people um, and leadership, that takes a lot, of, a lot of time to accomplish that. And we recognize that as a council is that, you know, how can we make it where it's got some staying power? And uh, so we looked at the worship coordinator, we looked at the discipleship, and we looked at the next gen. We recognize we have an opportunity that we'd like to present to the congregation of bringing on a, um, a pastor. A pastor of uh, worship and discipleship is really the title that we're given this position that we're making a recommendation. Um, you'll get a handout, the ushers will be at each door, Make sure you get it. It'll give a good uh, description of why we have arrived at this. Um, also, the job description of each area. And that's uh, the, the descriptions on the back pages that you'll see. That's more of what the focus of that ministry is. But the person that we're looking to hire is a person that's going to facilitate, administrate, and we're going to grow as a congregation. They're going to help those people and nurture one of the things uh, Keith Dornboss was instrumental in telling us is that our congregation really needs to lead. The people that we have here, when we hire folks, have to help us administer and grow us so that we can be leaders. So what we're looking to do is grow leaders within our church, nurture our new members, and uh, really kind of make sure we have a, a good, strong spiritual walk. So a couple details uh, with the... Um, with Carissa stepping down and uh, Brother John uh, no longer uh, involved, he's involved with the Baptist uh, Church here in Glenwood, um, we have some monies available. So we're looking for an additional spend of $30,000, so it nets out to a $60,000 position. And again, there's more details in the, uh, the document. So we look at it as instrumental in developing our church. It's something new for us. Um, and uh, we feel it's also going to be a compliment to pastor. Um, and we're focusing on our programs and developing those programs to make them something really special. So, again, the council um, went through this discussion. It took us about, uh, pastor, about six months. Yeah, ever, you know, we knew Chris was kind of coming in there, transition. And we've had a fantastic group of the worship uh, team stepping up and knew that they had, we said it's gonna be a little bit of a marathon that's ahead of you yet, and they've really done a fantastic job of doing this gap filling while we're in this transition. But I think it'll give good insight to the congregation of where we'd like to go as a, um, as a council. This was brought forward with a unanimous vote, uh, both with the deacons and the elders. So this has got strong support from the council um, and they were very excited to bring it forward. So hopefully you look at it in the light that I laid out before you. More details here, feel free to reach out to me or any other council member. They're well versed in this and uh, make sure we have open dialogue. Uh, but our hope and prayer is to develop you, develop the congregation and make sure all our new members that pastor's talking about uh, feel very welcome to our church. Thank you.
Thank you, Miles. So uh, as you'll get those packets before you leave today, it's a reminder to be praying for our church. Uh, this is an exciting time to be uh, even having these conversations and continue to pray for the Spirit's leading as we make some of these decisions. So uh, we're thankful for our congregation and the partnership that we have here. And uh, this is an important way that we hope that God continues to uh, help us grow into our mission. With that, I invite our deacons to come forward to receive our offerings. First time around is for the general fund, the broad ministries of our church, and the second time around is for benevolence. That's helping those in particular need in our community. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this day of worship. 
want to thank you for our tithes and offerings that are collected today. And we ask your blessings upon our general fund. Be with the deacons as they uh, distribute the money where it's needed. And we ask your blessings upon a benevolence fund so we can help those in need in our community. And as we pray, amen. People of God, I invite you to stand as God sends us from this place. Worship in this space comes to an end, but our worship continues throughout the rest of the week, and God promises to send us his spirit to go with us to receive this parting blessing from 1 Thessalonians 5, people of God. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Grace be with you all, and all God's people said, amen. Thank you.